There we go. Well, we'll give an, another minute or two. It's only 9 o'clock now, but if Esther's not here already, and if Mark and Jackie aren't here already, I know they went to Virginia Beach. That was last week. See her brother. So well, the Martins sure. are online. So. Martins are online. Barry and Brenda, that's, they're probably looking at leaves, too, up in the mountains. So, Jean, there's Jean, Jean, she plays in this thing. Jean, yeah, yeah, she should be here. Jean, LaVon, they'll probably come late to just go right up. And probably Esther, up too. And Esther. That's what I'm guessing. And the bell's playing. Today. Yeah, the golden bell. So, that's what I meant. They probably, unlike Christine, who's a great student, <laughs> who comes and then just takes in what she can and leaves. I get it. The other three, they just decide they're not coming at all because they know they have to leave early. So hopefully that's the case. Hopefully they're not unable to play ballast because then you're oh. not going to have enough for ballast. That would be a, that would be a problem. Stay Phil. <laughs> that would yeah. be a problem. I always felt for me that it was easier to easier to show up than it was to cancel. Mm. Consistory and everything, you know, I just made sure that I, that was the night that I made sure I showed up. Yeah. And I'd look around and I'd go, oh my, there's two or three people aren't here. Well, if I sign up for something, I try and make sure I show up. Well, good. I hope said, this is, as long well, as this isn't an indication. Well, some of my tired. college classes weren't like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> There was one Friday afternoon class that I don't think I was there once. No, oh, no. Mondays and Wednesdays I was there. That we found out the teacher he didn't take role. He didn't care who was there, who wasn't there, whatever. No. And somehow I got a C. I don't know how. It was a psychiatry, no psychology class. It was one I should have been there for, but uh, I didn't learn a thing in there. But somehow I got a C. I attended all my psychology classes and I never learned a thing. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I like psych. Did you? Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. I did pretty good in that class too. <laughs> my my son, uh, when by the time he got to college, he said that students' parents were calling the instructor saying, "Why did my child pass?" Didn't come to class. Right. Well, couldn't you get him up? Did you know this or that? They were trying to get their kid a passing grade. Oh. Here they are in college. If you're not passing if you're flunking out. If get you're coming. You're done. <laughs> yep. All right, everyone. We will get started. Chapter nine is a little bit longer than the last one, I think. So, I am going to offer prayer. And we will commence. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful today to be in your presence. Maybe a few less than we typically are, but Lord, you are here. Your word is going to be uh, looked at and studied, and we pray that we will receive what you need us to hear, see, and take to heart as we do so. Bless our time together. Show us what we need to see, and we'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to turn this heat off. I think. I don't think we need any heat. Or air conditioning at the moment. Yep. I definitely don't need more heat. Richard, if you start getting cold, then you yell. No, I put my coat on. <laughs> I'm covered. All right. Let's look at Revelation 9. As I was saying, I hope. People not being here is in an occasion they're getting tired of this because we still have like 10, 11 more chapters to go. So, all right, we're picking up with the trumpets. We heard four of them blown last week. Now we're going to get some more. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given authority like the authority of scorpions of the earth. 
They were told not to damage the grass of the earth or any green growth or any tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torture them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses equipped for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had scales like iron breastplates, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails like scorpions with stingers, and in their tails is their power to harm people to fly, f for five months. They have as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. There are still two woes to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels were released, who had been held ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year to kill a third of humankind. The number of the troops of Calvary was 200 million. I heard their number. And this was how I saw the horses in my vision. The riders wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. The heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and the fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of humankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they inflict harm. The rest of humankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands or give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their fornication or their thefts. Chapter 9 of Revelation. So what caught your attention? What did you find yourself getting a picture of there or gave you pause or made you feel something, any of that? And this was how I saw the horses in my vision. Mm. Keep that in mind. Yes. <laughs> because, yeah, that is a very good point. Keep in mind, this is a vision. So, again, we want to get very some little. visions, too, and they're pretty strange. Yep. Yeah. Imagine if you put the locust in there too. Mm. I was picturing that as he's reading it, I was thinking, like, this Yeah. Yeah, very uh very interesting. But I think that's a very important point, Richard, always as we're reading this. This is all part of a vision and um kind of like a dream. And so to take everything literal, we're being something's being described here to us that John saw. That, as I said several times, and we'll say again here today in another spot, he's describing things to us that he himself doesn't really have a reference point for. So, anything else anyone wants to just lift up before I take off? What's that? The four angels. The four angels. You weren't thinking angels sent out to kill. Four angels. Four angels seem to be sent out to kill, and we don't think of angels as something, someone, some beings that are involved with killing. So that's something we'll want to pay attention to when we get to it. Anyone else? All right, well, let's work our way through this, because there's a lot here. <laughs> The fifth angel blew his trumpet. I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. A lot there. So notice this. The star had fallen. So the fifth angel doesn't watch the star fall. The star was already positioned on the earth after having fallen. So we're not watching something come out of the sky here. 
It's there on the earth already. Stars were often equated with deities in the ancient world. So this might be trying to reference a god with a little g that had fallen from its position in the pantheon of gods. That's a possibility. But there's a lot of other suggestions about this star. Probably the most dominant suggestion is that the star um, refers to the fall of Satan in a prehistoric battle over good and evil. That is something that many, many of us still probably understand as, uh, you know, where does Satan come from? Most people would say, well, Satan was once an angel, but he wanted to be like God, so God kicked him out of heaven, and now he's down on earth, and that's who Satan is. There's some validity to that. It all, much of that kind of idea comes from one of the apocryphal books. Remember I talked about the apocrypha being those books that you might find most of the time in a family Bible, one of those big thick Bibles, usually has the Old Testament, the New Testament, and in between is the apocrypha, which are kind of historical books, but also some of them are very um, poetic books that were written between, like, they were written by, in a period of 500 years between the end of the Old Testament accounts and the and Jesus coming. They just were never included in our Bibles, in the Protestant Bible. There's one book called First Enoch, from which this idea of Satan falling out of heaven, that's where that some of that comes from. <clears throat> but Jesus, if you remember when Jesus sent out the 70 or 72, whichever translation you want, and they came back. He sent them out two by two to go spread his word. They came back and they reported how they had healed people and shared the gospel. And Jesus says in Luke 10, 18, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. It's another place where people get this idea that this star having fallen is Satan. I think I referenced it last week. There's also a passage in Isaiah where he says, how you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly on the heights of Zaphon. I will ascend to the tops of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the depths of the pit. That image is right here in Revelation. Isaiah was specifically talking about Babylon, in whose captivity the Israelites were. Babylon, who's going to make a grand entrance in this book of Revelation very shortly. Um, but it isn't saying it's Satan. But people have taken that Isaiah passage and said, this is about Satan, satanic powers, Babylon. The only place that really specifically talks about this is in 2 Peter in the Bible. 2 Peter 2, 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains or pits of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. So that's pretty right there. It's the only place that we see that in Scripture. It's in 2 Peter, 2 Peter, which also mentions Enoch, so it seems to have an understanding of this other book of, e of First Enoch. So it, it recounts some of that same language. So <clears throat> many people have said that this fifth angel blows his trumpet, and what we're seeing is Satan. But, what? oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Why is Satan given the key to hell? Well, let's keep going and look at what happens here, because that's a good question. It is not the same star as back in chapter 8. We had a star that was seen falling. That was, or the stars were falling. That was a cosmic disturbance. Um, this here is presented more as some kind of divine agent, an angel of some sort. Um, it says, he, I saw a star that fallen, 
uh, he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. So this star is actually a creature of some sort, some sort of being. Is it an angel? It does not say that. There are some who say, well, the person who got the, the, the being that got this key was the fifth angel who blew the trumpet. But the grammar indicates it's referencing the star as having been given the key. Um, so again, it being a fallen star over the centuries, different interpretations have been given. The, um, the Pietrists that I talked about, the ones who looked at everything as a first century deal, they say this was Nero, Emperor Nero. Others say it is a fallen angel, like Satan. Others say it's an angel of the abyss or just an evil spirit. Still others, there are a small faction that still look at all this maybe in more upbeat terms and have suggested the star is the word of God. That the, when the word of God confronts us, confronts the world, confronts the people, and this might be one of those idealist people, how they look at this. But when the word of God confronts us, we either repent, which we're going to see is the intentions of all this, or when God's word hits us in the vernacular, all hell breaks loose in our lives. When we really let the word in, it stirs everything up from the depths of who we are. So there are some who say that's what's happening here. Who gives the key? Again, we don't know who gives the key. It doesn't necessarily say that. Some say that it's God that gives the key. Others say that uh, it's the, the, the human sinfulness. The idealists, again, would sort of say human sinfulness opens the pit of our, of our lives. Um, but the key here, pardon the pun, the key here is the key was given. Was given, which indicates that who's ever opening this pit and the opening of this pit and everything that comes out of this pit is not, it's in someone else's control. The star, the angel, whatever it is, cannot open this pit without a key that they do not have, but are given presumably by God. So the point tends to be that we're still looking at the fact that God is sovereign over all of this. Everything that's happening here, God still is the one who has the control. He's allowing things. He's not necessarily doing the things, but he's allowing all this to transpire. He is giving the key in this instance. The bottomless pit is literally, and some translations are a little better at this, Literally, the shaft of the abyss, okay? It's, it's not a pit that's locked. It's a long shaft down to this abyss. That's locked. Not, not a pit per se, but a shaft. We hear about the abyss elsewhere when Jesus encounters the man who has the demons that identify themselves as legion. And they plead to Jesus. They say, don't send us back to the abyss. Same word. Don't send us back to this abyss place, which makes one understand that this abyss seems to be something that's um, inhabited by demons, inhabited by Satan, perhaps, inhabited by evil. Um, Paul uses the word in Romans 10, 7, when he says, who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. So that Paul talks about the abyss as a place for the dead. A little different than demons. 
We're going to run into this abyss again at least four more times in Revelation. Wherever it appears, here and elsewhere in Revelation, it's used to describe or indicate the habitation of spirits of some sort, but spirits that are firmly under God's control. Because every time it comes up, God still seems to have control over what's about to happen. Contrary to popular belief, it is not, wherever else it's described, this abyss is not a place of punishment. Okay? It's never stated that there's punishment that's going on here. It's inhabited by beings or forces that seem to be hostile to God, but under God's control. And they do not seem to be there receiving punishment. They're cast there, and they're, it's an abyss, maybe more of a nothingness. Um, but we're not told that they're there being punished. That's something we kind of have implied or imposed into that image that we have. It seems to represent a, a accumulation of evil power, um, a reservoir of evil. And these, if there's demons there, they might be the demons that, again, in the in the understanding of their of the pre ancient history, you could say. They would be demons that potentially were the offspring of the union between angels and women back in Genesis 2. Um, or they're the product of the human adultery that God is, or that's being challenged here by the end of this chapter. Uh, but customarily, we surmise that this is an evil agent acting by divine permission and not the same angel that we're going to see comes on the scene in chapter 20, who ends up holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. Seems to be a different angel. We'll get there when we're on chapter 20. But that's what gets us all confusing. A reoccurrence of images that may or may not be talking about the same thing. All right. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Again, here we, like we talked about last week, we probably have a repetition or, or an indication of one of the plagues of the Exodus story, because one of those plagues, the ninth plague, was darkness. So again, there's the plagues being kind of revisited and unleashed. But from the smoke came locusts on the earth. So again, just to kind of refine our image in our mind and what we've always heard and thought about when we consider some of this picture. The smoke, um, we typically attribute to our picture of hell, which we associate to the bottomless pit. However, the pit here is most synonymous with the Old Testament understanding of Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, or Hades, which were considered places of gloom and darkness and nothingness. And we're more of a holding place for the dead than a place of fire and smoke and torment and punishment. They were just a gloomy, dark, nothingness place. There wasn't, there wasn't all the screaming and fire and all that we have in our minds because this pit is more associated with Sheol and Hades than it is our understanding of hell. Hell in the Bible references an actual kind of place called Gehenna, which was a, a burning pile of waste. It was never something that was underground or in the underworld. 
It was just a, a place that was used to describe something that would be an ongoing fire and people were thrown into Gehenna, into the waste dump. Centralia. Like Centralia. Exactly. So we're not necessarily talking here about hell. We're talking about a pit that is best understood in terms of Sheol and Hades, not in our idea of hell. Gehenna is not brought into the picture here. So the smoke might best be associated with the, the image that these locusts present of, of ferocity and fearsomeness and attribute to the locust more than a description of where they came from. Okay. The locust can't help but conjure up another Exodus plague because they too had to experience the eighth plague was the locust that came. But even more so, interestingly enough, if you go to the prophet Joel, chapters 1 and 2, you are going to find Joel talking about an invading army like locusts. And many of the descriptions of the locusts that we're going to see here are also in Joel's description hundreds of years earlier. So again, like I've said many times, John's vision included a whole lot of things that John and his Jewish listeners would have been very familiar with from their understanding of Old Testament prophets and Old Testament stories. So the locust, now in Joel, the locusts clearly represent an invading army. He says, for a nation has invaded my land, powerful and innumerable like locust. The locust in Joel damaged vegetation, and locusts in general damaged vegetation. And they were sent for the purpose of repentance. Okay? Because Joel, several times, is trying to get the Israelite people to repent. And the locusts are an image that are sent. The invading army is sent to get them to repent. In Joel, it also says, they have the appearance of horses. And like war horses, they charge. In Joel, it also says the sun and the moon are darkened and the, with, uh, the stars withdraw their shining. Joel also says that they were num numberless, innumerable. In Revelation, these locusts assume a demonic kind of nature because they come from this abyss and they have such an unusual description such a fierce description so people usually say these locusts are demonic they're demons my only counter to that is of all the times jesus cast out demons and there was talk of demons in the gospel we never have a description of them in any way as being locusts or anything else anything else that was scary so we don't get that description but people generally take the description of these locusts and say they are demons where the context for that comes from, I haven't really found. We're told they were given authority like the authority of scorpions on the earth. Again, notice, they were given authority. They didn't have any authority on their own. Someone, God, gave them authority. So God continues to be in control over this whole thing. No matter how things might look, and that, again, is the recurring word of this of i think of this vision from john to the seven churches no matter how bad it looks god is still the one dealing with this the god who's going to save you they were told the locusts were told not to damage the grass of the earth or any green growth or any tree but only those people who do not have the seal of god on their foreheads again my little side question I've asked several times before, who told them? We don't know who told them. Again, presumably God, but we're not actually told that God from the altar told them this or that. But they were told 
not to damage the grass, etc. Locusts typically ate and destroyed vegetation, affecting humans by creating famines, but they never physically damaged people. But these locusts don't damage the vegetation. They damage, not kill. They damage humans. And then we again have a, a Exodus reference because these people have a seal upon them and the locust will bypass them. Just like in Exodus, the people have the seal or the, the symbol or the blood, literally the blood, on their door frames so that the spirit of death would bypass them. So very Exodus-like again. They were allowed to torture them for five months, but not kill them. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings someone. Five months. Just like last week, and again this week we're going to read about the one-third. One-third of this is going to be destroyed. One-third of that's going to be destroyed. In a moment we're going to read about one-third of humans are going to be killed. Five months. These are all t limited times. That's the point. It's not going to be forever. It's not going to be everybody. It's not going to be all the world. It's going to be a limited number of people, a limited number of time, amount of time. Five months is actually fairly, nothing really special about that because naturally speaking, locusts generally do their work over a course of five months. Uh, the spring and early summer, or no, spring through late summer, five month period is usually how long locusts tend to do their thing. So to say five months um, really is in line with what a locust normally would do. But it also is indicating that they're not going to be here forever. And this is not going to last forever. Limitations again point to the fact that these creatures, these demons, are not in control. But they're under the mandate or jurisdiction or the control of someone else. Presumably God. And in those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long. The, even, the, the word long here really means they will, they will just, there's, there's an intensity of how much they want to die. But death will flee from them. Again, this is suggesting judgment, but not final judgment. Because there's an opportunity for repentance. That's a big part of what's happening here. God is allowing time. John is envisioning that God is allowing time, opportunity, chance for people to look upon this judgment and ju destruction and still have a chance to repent and come to him. According to the Jewish tradition, the plagues of Exodus served to kind of ready the people of Israel, kind of strengthen them while judging punishing the Egyptians in order to move those Egyptians' hard heart, particularly Pharaoh's hard heart, to repentance. So the idea of repentance is part of this as well, just as it was with the Exodus. In appearance, the locusts were like horses equipped for battle. Again, in Joel, he says they have the appearance of horses, and like war horses, they charge. Horse is actually a common compare. Again, this sounds weird, horses, but it's actually throughout history has been a common comparison made with locusts. In fact, the word for locust in German is a word that translates to hay horse. And in Italian, it's a word that translates to little horse. So inspecting a locust apparently you could have a, an appearance, obviously, of a much, 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 much smaller horse, but it looks like a horse. On their heads were what looked like, and again, looked like. John is not telling you this is what it actually was. He doesn't have a point of reference, so he's saying it was like crowns of gold. So it seemed as though likely these, these things had a yellow brilliance to them. Their faces were like human faces. The implication here is that what's being stated is the, the, these locusts had some intelligence to them, human face, human intellect. Their hair like women's hair. 
There is some ancient writings in which there's descriptions of locusts and in which their antenna are compared to hair. But it's also believed here that, again, this is just another way of describing the strength and the power and the magnitude of these, of these locusts. Because hair, if you remember your Samson story, hair in ancient times, the longer it was, the more strength you might have. So there's that possibility. And I'll bring this up again a couple other places. It was also historically known that the Parthians, who will eventually come and battle the Romans, who are from the north and the east, the Parthians were known for their long hair. And some other things, as we're going to see in a moment. Their teeth was like lion's teeth. Um, in Joel, it says the locust there had teeth or lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. This is, again, to represent the cruelty, ferociousness, not so much the appearance. They had scales like iron breastplates, indicating that they were probably indicating they were fairly indestructible. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. Again, Joel describes his locusts. Like war horses, they charge, as was the rumbling of the chariots. They leap on the tops of the mountains. And then they have a tail like scorpions with stingers, which means they had really sharp points. And in their tails is their power to harm people for five months. So again, in the midst of this terrifying picture, the main point John is communicating is that this process of judgment and retribution is controlled and limited by God. The star can only open the pit having been given a key. There's only a, there's a five-month limit to things here. The trumpets blow. When trumpets blow, it's an indication of calling to repentance. So there's, there's this time to still get to God. The locusts have a king over them, it says in verse 11, um, which interestingly contradicts Proverbs 30, 27, which says the locusts have no king, yet all of them march in rank. But that's probably suggesting, again, these are not ordinary locusts, but maybe something demonic. They have a king over them. The king is the angel of the bottomless pit. The angel it doesn't say it's a demon. It says it's an angel. Can it be an evil angel? We often like not to think in things that way, but possible. It could be the same as the star that had the key to unlock the pit, but it doesn't necessarily say that because that was a star. Now we're told it's an angel. Are they the same? Uh, we don't know. 100%. It's the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. In Greek, he is called Ap Apollyon. Both of those words in Hebrew and Greek mean destruction. So that's the point here. This is an angel who has oversight or whatever, leadership of the bottomless pit from which destruction comes. The word Apollyon could also be a sideways reference and dig to the emperor at the time, Dominitan, because he liked to regard himself as the god Apollos. So they may be kind of, again, John's vision may be implying if you're a Peterist who looks at things just from the, from the time of John, this might be a reference to the emperor Dominitan, that he was the angel who's overseeing the pit of destruction, the emperor. The point is that these are sources of destructions and destroyers of the earth. Verse 12, the first woe has passed. There are still two woes to come. It, it is interesting, and maybe just a side note, but it is interesting that our most of our English translations do not include the word behold, which actually is in the Greek, it says 
the first woe is past. Behold. In other words, look at this. Pay attention to this. There are still two woes to come. So we don't have that behold in there. But the idea of really noticing what's about to happen or what's about to be said is important there. Verse 13, the second part of the chapter. The sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God. The four horns were prescribed of God back in Exodus when they constructed the temple's altar. In Exodus 27, 1 to 2, it says, You shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long, five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and it shall be three cubits high. You shall make horns for it on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. So the four horns of the altar would have been something all these people would have been able to vision because they've been to the temple, they've seen the altar, they've seen the horns. The golden altar, back in chapter 8, it is from the golden altar that the prayers of the saints were lifted up. So now the sixth angel blows his horn. We hear a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. What we're getting here is a possible image to reiterate the power of the prayer and more so to note that perhaps what is about to come is an answer to those prayers that were lifted up from that golden altar where the four horns are. I heard a voice whose voice, again, we're not told whose voice it is. It could be the angel at the altar, because back in chapter 8, we're told another angel with a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given a great quantity of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar that is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. It could be that angel that speaks from the four corners of the four horns of the golden altar. But it says to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. There's a lot of angels in this book, and they are not the same angels. So now we have four more angels. Again, the four angels. So there are specific four angels that these people would have known about or heard about in their stories. So there's four angels that it appears are in charge of this cavalry that's going to be unleashed. They are bound at the great river Euphrates. The Euphrates River was often considered by the Romans and the Jews to be a boundary of sorts between the Roman Empire and the Parthians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians, okay? All the people that were not only against Rome, but ended up not the Parthians as much, but the Babylonians and Assyrians had the, the Israelites in captivity. So they are all the foes that are beyond the Euphrates. The four angels are bound at the Euphrates. It indicates that they are restrained, maybe involuntarily restrained. Um, again, we usually identify them as bad or evil angels. But it doesn't necessarily say that. They are just four angels who are bound. And they are bound because they were being there, held there to be ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year to kill a third of humankind. Again, a third. It's not the majority. It's a stern warning, but it's not saying that we're going to blot out humankind. There's no description of how the killing 
is going to be committed right then. Though later in verse 18, we are told that fire and smoke and sulfur are going to be the plagues that kill the, the people. So they're defined as plagues. But how fire, smoke, and sulfur do it, there's nothing to describe that. The number of the troops of Calvary was 200 million. I heard their number. Now, just, again, a note of reading this sort of literally and taking every point. We don't really know who this troop or Calvary is. They just kind of are mentioned. Like, they're not, it would appear, the locust. But they could be the locust. But that was a different trumpet. That was a different thing. Now we have a trumpet sound, and we're told about troops of, of Calvary, like cavalry, cavalry. Like we already knew about these people or this cavalry. We don't from our nine chapters up to this point. But we're told they're 200 million. They could be demonic, they could be a human, they could be mixture. But the definite article of the indicates that they're specific and they're known to the readers and the listeners. The 200 million is not necessarily a real number as much as a phrase to talk about just incalculable. It's just a huge number. The futurists, if we go back to our three groups, the ones who are trying to equate all this with our day, have been known to say that 200 million is China because they are a nation known to have recorded and publicly stated they have 200 million troops. So when you read interpretations from a futurist standpoint, usually that's China. And this was how I saw the horses in my vision. The riders wore breastplates the color of fire and a sapphire. The word sapphire there is also interpreted and known as hyacinth, which was likely a a dull, dark blue. Maybe some have said like a sulfur smoke would appear kind of dark blue, dull and dark blue. And the sulfur, which is also at times interpreted as brimstone, which is a, a light yellow, like the settling of fumes kind of color. The heads of the horses, um, and, and just a side note here, we've heard about horses before in terms of the locusts looking like horses, but here now we have horses. It's important to note that of all the biblical references to horses, except for one, they're all connected to war. A horse virtually always is related to war. Okay? So these guys, this cavalry, cavalry, I always have a hard time with that word, cavalry involved horses. The heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths, which again indicates a ferocity, a destructiveness, just like the, the locusts. Again, the futurists who try to look at all this and apply it to today kind of think this is all a description of modern day weaponry and armament. The preterists who look at this all as something that happened in the first century during John's time are saying these are probably the Parthians because there's some things about the descriptions here that describe what was known of, of their armor or their costumes. The idealists, the people who look at this all more symbolically, see this just as a, not just, they see this as a description of the tenacity of evil that we face in life. By these three plagues, a third of humankind was killed by fire, smoke, sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they inflict harm. So again, the introduction of a serpent immediately leads most people to think about these as satanic or evil because it takes us back to Genesis 3 where the serpent seemed to represent Satan or a devil. So we bring all that into this story, though none of that's stated here. 
We've yet to have anything state that this is demonic. We've had anything to state that this is satanic or Satan. Um, but we throw all that in because now we hear the word serpent. So, oh, oh, it's a serpent from Genesis 3. Some note historical evidence again of the Persians, uh, excuse me, the Parthians, because they were known to twist the tail of their war horses so that they looked like snakes. And their horsemen were also famously known for their ability to shoot arrows while riding backwards on their horses so that they could shoot from the front, from the mouth, and they could shoot from the back, the tail of the horse. Thus, many look at this from the preterist standpoint of first century, where the Parthians, who will soon invade Rome, or the Roman Empire, were known to ride, have big, big cavalries, and tails on their horses that look like snakes and be able to shoot sharp pointy things from the mouth and the tail end of the horse. Um, the rest of humankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of, literally out of, indicating they didn't change out of or abandon the works of their hands, which is a reference to idols that they were making, things that they could held in their hands, but they didn't, they didn't labor, they didn't do anything. They didn't also give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. They did not repent, which seems to be the, the indicate the purpose behind all the suffering, all the woes were still done to create an opportunity for repentance, which they didn't do. Just like in Exodus, the plagues were intended to have Pharaoh repent, which he finally did, but then actually didn't, because he went after them anyway. When he let them go, he still went after them. In the last verse, they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries. The word sorceries here is interesting. Because there's four things that are listed. Murder, sorcery, fornication, thefts. Murder, fornication, and theft is listed other places in the New Testament as things to be repented of. Sorceries is listed in this, in this particular grouping. It's an interesting word. It, it probably indicates like uh, potions, magic arts that use potions and things. For us today, it's interesting to note that the word itself in the Greek is the word from which we get our word pharmacy, drugs. So the idea seemed to be of potions and drugs that people were using in. You say the sorceries. The sorceries, yeah. yeah. So the expected repentance was twofold. Verse 20, they were to renounce their idolatrous beliefs and associations with these idols. And secondly, they were to renounce in verse 21, their immoral practices, sorcery, murder, fornication, theft. So this is the third that was left, so, you're saying? Um, the two thirds that was left. Two thirds. Right, because a third was, was killed. Those who were left, uh, did not repent. The rest of humankind that were not killed by the plagues did not repent. Again, it's interesting to hear full, more fully the words of Jesus when those 70 or 72 that he sent out returned. As I read earlier, but I'll kind of read a little bit more. He, they said, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That 
in some ways is again what John's vision seems to be saying in this huge, elaborate, mystifying way. Again, that you folks who are following Jesus and are going through snakes and scorpions and all this stuff, God's going to give you the authority to have victory over that. And you're going to be able to have your names written in heaven. You will be with God, worshiping with the 24 elders and the four creatures and all those angels and all that. So again, kind of what I end with each time in a different way maybe, remembering that this letter or vision was written, it was given for the Christian church. It was not given for the Roman Empire. It was given to seven churches, ultimately. We got to recognize that a teaching being shared here is to Christians, instructing them that they live and will live in this world, a world of unrepentance, persecution, opposition to them and to God. So they must not expect to live in a world that understands or understood them and welcomes their witness. They're going to have problems. No matter how severe the judgments of God that they're going to see, and they're going to brush past them at times, the world continues with its idolatries and its sins. It's going to keep going. So it's going to be tough. But there is victory, which is what we're gleaning in some ways each time, because God still seems to be the one in control. So that is chapter 9. Thoughts, questions, are we still able to hang in there with this? Yeah, I, it's been interesting to, to look at all this. Once you, you know, when you break it down from, you have such a, a good knowledge of, of the thinkings and, and everything, it makes a lot more sense when you start seeing the symbolism that's in there. Well, like I said before, I'm trying to present to you different Different perspectives. Because to, to ever have anybody tell you, here's what Revelation says, man, you just walk right out the door. <laughs> because unless you're interested in hearing what one take on Revelations is and are able to keep in your mind, this is one idea. And again, it's going to fall into one of those three kind of categories. And there's probably truth in each one of those. But I keep I thinking vision. <laughs> that's right. And I think that's that I really do think that's an important an important thing to keep in mind at all times with this. It was a vision. After how many glasses of wine? <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know. That I may not say, but all right. Thank you all on Zoom. Um I don't see the church up on Zoom yet, so I'm going to keep this on. <laughs> Let's see here. What I'm going to do to make sure I don't lose you. I'm going to make Sunday School a co-host. Okay. All right, everybody on Zoom, hang in there. If you get lost, you shouldn't. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You got it. <laughs> I'm going to turn off the sound and the picture down here.
Yes, test.